Hello and welcome to Unsolved Canadian Mysteries. My name is Kenton Young. I'm sitting here with my co-host Dylan Fairman. Hey. We are recording this after Christmas and after New Year's, but uh, either way, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's and uh, hope all is well with you guys. Yeah, and a happy after New Year's. Yes. The recovery. Yes, yes. We only did that after the holidays. <clears throat> so this is our, our final of four episodes, kind of a paranormal uh, unsolved mystery. Right. And then next week and the next few weeks are going to be more like true crime. <sighs> true crime. And I'm really excited for the next one. I'll, I'll kind of look you tease it uh, at the end of this episode. Okay. Okay. You have to stick around yeah, to know what's coming don't, next. Don't skip ahead. That's yeah. cheating. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Dylan, uh, last time we were talking about uh, Lake Ontario. Yes. The um, the one that does not have Ogopogo. Yes. And we got a few comments online uh, about oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> about how okay. oh, Ogopogo was apparently in Lake Okanagan in B.C., so, so none of them have no, Ogopogo. No, none of them. No! <laughs> it came up. I wanted to mention <laughs> it. But I also thought he was in Ontario. There is a sea creature apparently in one of, of the lakes there out is. there, but not Ogopogo, which is too bad. Damn. Maybe he, like, this is his tourism spot in the summer he goes down there or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like his winter home or something, yeah. or his summer home, whatever. Uh, this time we're talking about Quebec. We've got to show our French friends some love. Do they like it when you say Quebec or Quebec? Quebec. Okay. They speak Quebecois. Quebecois. They speak Quebecois. Yeah. What's that mean? Like French, but Quebec French. Oh. I know we've talked about this, and you said the furthest you've been out uh, that direction is Toronto. Uh, yes. But as we know, I like to say things, and then a little later I change the fact. I'm just saying that maybe later on I'll be like, oh, I'm talking I was in uh, Newfoundland. Okay, okay, okay. Newfoundland is further east, yeah. A little bit. It's kind of weird with the map because of, like, the way the continent kind of curls. Right. Like, New York is the same kind of area as uh, Toronto, even though there's so much more of Canada. Right. And also for the fact that whoever designed the globe uh, doesn't like Africa and really likes uh, North America. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Making us significantly bigger than a massive continent. Uh, even like South America, it's so far west. Like we're on like the same middle time zone, South America. Mm. But we think them as kind of like the same area as North America. Right. But they're so much further. Really? The things we learn in school are not always correct. It's true. So I, I'm sure we did learn this in school, but I actually didn't, like, remember it until I actually went out there. But do you remember the Battle of the Plains of Abraham or learning about it in school? Abraham, Abraham. That's the guy who uh, he had his son and yep. he was going to kill him yep. for God. Yes, that, that was, yeah. Okay. That was one of them, yeah. <laughs> We're not talking about him. Okay. Okay. Um, Abraham. That was the guy with the beard from uh, Walking Dead. Yes. He gets bashed with a bat. But I, I assume those are not the ones. No. Okay. Or Abe Lincoln. <laughs> okay. Or Abe Lincoln. The, <laughs> the other Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> other other one. Whatever. <laughs> okay. So um, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham was this de deciding battle between uh, New France and the English Empire. Okay. So prior to the battle, New France uh, went from like the St. Lawrence River across North America down to around uh, New Orleans. Okay. And then between that kind of uh, area and the coast is where England has. Like the 13 colonies have were mil later make the United States. And on the other side of the continent, uh, New Spain kind of went up towards California and through Mexico, that whole area. Okay. That's why there's so many Spanish names on that coast, even though they're nowhere near uh, Mexico. So that's kind of how the geography is looking at this time. Okay, the kind of political boundaries. So the uh, Battle of the Plains of Abraham was the final battle between the British and New France, which were the French. They had gone and gone back and forth over the past over the previous years. There's lots of articles and accounts of the British bombing Quebec City with cannons. So okay, so artillery like like mortar kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Cannonballs and that kind of thing. Yeah. We're talking about like the seventeen right. fifties, right? So it's all like it's it's not really any explosives. It's more like just really heavy kinetic. Things. Yeah, <laughs> kinetic yeah. energy. Yes. 
A lot of it. Yeah. So there's lots of stories of like churches getting just completely obliterated, buildings getting destroyed. Quebec City is kind of built like on a, in a valley. So they have the rich people on top and the poor ones at the bottom. Oh, nice. Uh, as it usually goes, right? <laughs> there's lots of articles and stories about them just getting hit again and again and again by these mortar shells or whatever that the British are sending at them. But Quebec City also has this this fort, this citadel, kind of built into the, the hills. So you can't see it from uh, water. You can't see it from the water level. Because like it's built in such a way that all the buildings are underneath the top of the hill. So it's like right. you can Look, see it from above, but not like lower this. elevation. Yeah. Yeah. So the British couldn't hit it because they couldn't see it, but they could hit the British back. So there's this ongoing fight where the British attack, the French would defend, the British would leave. The British would come back, they attack, and it would kind of be a cycle for, for a long time. So the British decided to change it up, right, as, as you do mm. in war. And they decided to do something that doesn't usually happen in, like, modern combat. They attacked themselves. No. Okay, sorry. They attacked at night. So they would land their boats at the Plains of Abraham, and they'd walk up behind the citadel and attack it on, on land. They say the battle lasted 15 minutes because the French were not ready for a land attack, and then Quebec City fell. Within, I think it was about four years, the entirety of New France would dissolve and become part of the British Empire. So, like, this was a big turning point in Quebec City history, right? Uh, it went from being a French colony to being a British colony. They say, actually, what after what happened in Quebec City, by the time the British got to Montreal, just down the St. Lawrence River, I guess up the river, Montreal just gave them the keys to the city, and mm. they didn't even put up a fight after what they heard what happened in Quebec City. So this is kind of where our story starts taking place. It's been a couple years since uh, Quebec City has fallen to the British, and the British are trying to start uh, reorganize the world, reorganize this colony into a British colony. War is easy to declare, but it's, it's a lot more difficult to do like nation building. And one of the challenges uh, with this is language barrier and laws. Because like it goes from, well, for example, in France, the drinking age is like 14. Woo! But, but here the drinking age is 19. So like you can imagine changes in culture, changes in tradition, those kind of things would cause some problems, right? Especially when a country is so well established as New France. If I could drink when I was 14, that's just a horrible, horrible mistake. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's all differences, right? Because in, in France, uh, like drinking is more of a casual recreational uh, community thing. Where here, it's a celebratory thing. The people get really drunk for big occasions over there. They just kind of drink casually all the time. Mm. So it, it's different in cultures, different traditions. And that's why the laws are different, right? So when the British Empire took over what was New France, they had to deal with some of these conflicting laws. And they decided to just leave it with French laws for now. Slowly integrate the new British laws into it, but just leave it French because like there's already enough resistance going on. Yeah, and it works. Yeah, leave it alone. It works. People are fine with this. So this is where uh, this, our story kind of takes place uh, with the murder of Marie Corvio's husband. <gasps> so they found him in his barn. His face had been smashed in. Jeez. Like, oh, like hammer to the face, like caved in. Well, they thought what happened was that in the barn there was a, a horse and it was right. obviously the horse had kind of got out of control during the night and that the horse had kicked his face in. Right. And that was pretty, like, it made sense, right? Have you seen some of those videos where people get smacked in the jaw by like a, a horse? Yeah. I always, I'm always like, I feel like their head should be gone. Yeah, it, it's brutal. <laughs> it's not like, like a cat paw or a dog paw. It, <laughs> a it's a piece paw. of wood to the face. <laughs> Oh, steel in some cases. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Yeah, with the hooves. Yeah. Yeah. So as they were like, they didn't have like forensic equipment and that kind of stuff, but they had like basic autopsy and they looked at this body and determined that, well, certainly the horse had had a bit of a rough night and had made a mess. The injuries to this guy's face wasn't caused by a hoof. It was caused by a sharp object, like an ax. Oh. So they began the investigation, they interviewed the family, they interviewed the wife, they interviewed the kids, interviewed the neighbors, the friends, trying to figure out what, what could have happened. And it was determined that it was Marie Corvio's father that killed her husband. And the reasoning here was because the husband was abusive to Marie and to the, the kids. So one night, the husband cornered him in the barn, took an axe to his face, and blamed it on the horse. Just goes to show, don't beat your wife or kids, because you'll get blamed for a horse's misdeed. Exactly. Exactly. They asked Marie Corvio's uh, father, did you do this? And he said, yes, I did. And it's kind of oh. an open and shut case. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Makes sense. But it was suspected that Marie had some kind of involvement in this too. 
right? Maybe she told him to do oh, it or something of that sort. I see, I see. So what they this what the the punishment was was that the father was going to be executed and the Marie was going to get the letter M carved into her hand, M for murderer. Oh. But she could live, which is fair because they had children and they didn't want to kill off her. Just, she, she just needs some grub, gloves. And well, then, uh, she's good. You can cover it up, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the day before his execution, they ask him, is there anything you want to admit to? Anything you want to come to terms with? Anything you want to renounce, right? Like your final, final, final thing. And he admitted that he had not killed Marie Corvio's husband. But they killed him anyway? No. He said that Marie had done it herself and that he took the blame so the kids wouldn't be orphans. And that that whole thing was her idea. They then asked Marie what, what, what had come out that were you responsible for this murder? And she admitted that yes, she was. So they had to have a retrial, right? And a and new investigation and come up with this. What kind of punishment should she receive? And then it came out that, well, yes, Marie Corvio's husband had died to an axe to the face, she had had a previous husband that had also mysteriously died. Uh, uh, what? It, it's mixed on what happened to him. Oh my God. <laughs> Some say she, he was poisoned. Others, and this one comes up a lot, is that hot lead was poured into his ear. Uh. So if it's obvious, this woman has some um, issues and, and she should not be with people. Wow. Wait, and this isn't a true crime episode? <laughs> it, it gets it gets okay. more bizarre. Okay, 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 okay. Well, this is already bizarre. Like, yeah. You could have like just said, oh, this is true crime. There you go. But no, there's more. There's more. There's more. The story's, the story's famous in Quebec for a reason. Quebec. They decide Marie has committed several crimes, right? Trying to convince her her dad to take, one of, take yeah. credit for the crime. Also killing the husband, possibly killing the past husband. And it was decided that Marie should be executed, should be hanged for her crimes. They decided to do something else too. So first of all, I think they found a tree, put a rope over the tree, around a noose, tied around her neck, hung her. And the story goes that because she was such a small woman, she was very, very petite, uh, they needed to put weights on her legs oh to snap her neck. Oh my god. But they want to make a point that whatever shenanigans was happening when the French were around isn't allowed now that the British are here. Because this whole executioning and what they did later isn't a British practice, it's a French practice. So they stuck with the French laws. Oh, I see. So they decided to make a, a statement out of Marie. And do you know what a gibbet is? A gibbet. A gibbet. Part of a turkey. No. Well, I think that's a... Uh, it a is. giblet. It's that's a giblet. giblet, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Have you heard... Like, I always thought it was pronounced a gibbet. Perhaps. Okay. Gibbet. 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 No. Okay. That's all right. So, have you ever seen... <clears throat> Pirates, of, Ca Pirates <laughs> of the Caribbean? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Many times. I'm sure there's some scenes in it where there's pirates in these, like, big cages just kind of hanging there. Yep. Okay. So these are the gibbets. Oh, I see. They're like giant cages where people put other people. Right. Usually uh, as, a, as, a, as like a... Slow torture. Yeah. Or teach a lesson, that kind of thing. Yeah. In this case, it was to embarrass Maria and to make a statement that her actions were not appropriate. So they put her dead body in one of these gibbets. Oh. But not all gibbets are built like a bird cage, right? They're not all open and kind of like, so the body can get flop around inside. Some of them are more form-fitting. So like they'll have a piece that goes under the head that holds it up, pieces around the arms to hold them up, pieces around the legs. Okay. That's more of a like form-fitting steel cage. Yeah. So they put her body in one of these. Now across the river from Quebec City is the town of Levy. I think it's how you say Levy. I think, Levy? Hey, I think that's what it's pronounced. Now, what is it? Anyway. Oh, Levy? They decided to put the gibbet with Marie's body in Levy. So not in Quebec City, but across the river in Levy. And uh, I don't know the reason why they chose that instead of Quebec City. Maybe they just didn't want it in their own city. Because it, it's always kind of been like Quebec City is the older brother, and Levy's the smaller brother, younger brother. So that's why they, maybe they, they did it. I'm not sure the exact reason, because the trial was in Quebec City. Okay. So they took this gibbet with Marie's body in it, and they hung it, I don't know if it's from a tree or from like a wooden platform, in Levy. And they said they had hung it for five weeks as kind of like a ultimate punishment to her and a statement to be made that what she was doing was not acceptable. But the story goes that as those five weeks went on, because they're on St. Lawrence River, there's all, lots of wind on St. Lawrence River, right? They could hear a whistling sound throughout the night. Uh, and they 
I mean, you think it's just the wind, right? Blowing under, this, under the door or through the window or wherever, right? But as the weeks went by, this noise got louder and louder. And it was no longer just a whistling, but it was like, like a person's scream. And they determined that this screaming voice every night was coming from within the gibbet. Was it the wind in the bars? Was it the wind around the limbs of the woman? Who knows? Right. Was it maybe the wind just blowing in her mouth and her lungs? Or Right. I was just going to say, <clears throat> like, what if the wind's like going in her ear and then coming out of her mouth through her teeth? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could be. Could be. So this itself... A lady was... flute. <clears throat> this was... <clears throat> Disturbing. But, uh... Not that bad, right? <clears throat> so the story goes that a gentleman was walking along the banks of the St. Lawrence one night. I think he was intoxicated or something and was walking to his to his residence. And he felt some hands go around the sides of his neck. And a voice in his ear that says, Take me to Isle of Norleans, which is this like island just north of Quebec City of the St. Lawrence. And now it's like a really nice farming community. Cool. Uh, but then I'm not sure what it was used for. And the voice said, take me to Alan Orleans. Let me be with my people. I can't cross the river without being with a baptized man. This guy turns around who was talking to him. And there in front of him, well, behind him, was the gibbet and the arms of Marie Corvier reaching out at him. No longer in the tree. So the story goes that he, it chased him down the river until he either says he either got home or he fell and collapsed and passed out. So now they, now there's a problem, right? This 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 woman who killed two people is apparently screaming at night and haunting people who walk past her. So they decide after five weeks, which was the long amount of time they were going to do this, they're going to take her down and bury it. So they took it down, they buried it, and that was the end of it. This was in the 1750s, right? Maybe 1760s, something like that. So a long time ago. And anytime you hear a story like this, it gets passed on and passed on, and of course it gets fictitious and it's more inflated yeah yeah elaborated and there's uh parts of the story that say that maria was a witch oh my goodness she sacrificed her husbands for witchcraft yes yeah a canadian witch i've never heard of a canadian witch. yes yes she's this a famous is... canadian witch wow cool and it, the reason she wanted to get to this island of norleans was because that's where the witches were gathering for the black sabbath to meet with satan oh so that's why she couldn't cross the baptized river uh, without, without being, uh, sorry, she couldn't cross the river without, without a baptized man because she wouldn't get to the Sabbath. This should be made into a fucking movie. <laughs> that's creepy. It gets worse. <laughs> oh. If you hear a story from 100 years ago, maybe Ogopogo or maybe, um, what's the one we have out here? The, uh, she's, that, she's that woman creature that haunts here. Um, um. Oh. Does she uh, walk down Victoria Avenue screaming at people? She, no. I've met her. <laughs> okay. She's horrible. What is she called? What is it called now? Oh. The screaming gopher. No. She dresses like a gopher and at nighttime haunts um, drunk people leaving all hands. The Windigo we have out here in Saskatchewan. Windigo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have, you know... Even things like Loch Ness or Bigfoot or those kind of things. But this, like, as time passed from the 1750s when this happened, you know, it was, is, is Marie Corvio just a story, right? Is it just like a legend people tell each other, right? Kind of like don't whistle under, under the Northern Lights or those kind of things. Oh, right. It was thought to be an urban legend about Marie Corvio and her husbands and, and the witches and the witchcraft and all that, right? And of course, then the story gets more inflated. Like they say that she didn't just kill two, two men, she killed seven men, right? Mm -hmm. I see. And that she was connected to the affairs of the poison that happened in France before the revolution, and all these things, right? But it's been written off as just being a story, right? So a century passed, it's 1850, right? So Canada, sorry, is just about to happen, about to be born in 1865. That's right, 65, yeah. We'll go with that. I'll believe you. Okay. So it's 1851, uh, and Quebec City is growing, Levy is growing, and uh, they start doing some archaeological digs to start building in more buildings, new houses, new shops, that kind of thing. And as they were digging, they found something. They found an old, rusted metal gibbet, gibbet, and everything within it had rotten, obviously, and dust turned to dust. The only exception is part of the leg. So this, they determined, had to have been the gibbet of Marie Corvio. 
this took what was supposed to be an urban legend from 100 years ago to reality. This is like finding like the weed, like, um, what's that board? Um, Ouija board? Ouija board. I was thinking that one from the movie. Um, they open the board up and it's like a terrible game to play. Jumanji. Jumanji, yeah. Jumanji. Or like anything that's like secret and hidden, they uncover it, right? Yeah. So this made news that they found this apparent uh, gibbet of Marie Corvio. The story is true that the woman is real, right? All this stuff. And so they put this cage in the museum, as you do, right? What, is, what, else, what else do you do with it, right? So this is where there's uh, some deviation on the stories. Some say, and this was told by the guide when I was on in Quebec City and on, on the walking tour, that shortly after they put the, the cage in the museum, the museum burned down. And as they were going through the wreckage and trying to figure out what happened, they determined the fire started where the cage was, but the cage had gone missing. Right, because why would the cage burn? Right. It's a metal cage. Right. So did the cage start the fire? Did someone start the fire? Where'd the cage go? Why is it missing? So when I went to Quebec City, this is kind of the, the question he posed. Like, what happened to the cage? This was in 1850, 1860 when this happened, when the cage was found and shortly again disappeared in, in a blazing fire. Now, again, like, people thought, well, is this just a story of this Mrs. Cage being discovered now it's suddenly gone, right? But, like, you can't have a story appear and then and then disappear. Like, it can't, that's not, like, it has to be true if this thing keeps happening. But there's no evidence of this cage, right? Beyond, you know, a couple of newspaper accounts, uh, some big announcements at the time, but besides that, nothing really happened. Years passed. And, like, we're now in the 2000s, like, 2013, the technological age, right? Mm -hmm. And there's um, some curators up in, in Quebec City helping catalog some uh, artifacts in other museums around North America. And they're looking at the, I think it's the Peabody Wessex Museum in Massachusetts. And they're looking at this, going through the archives, going through this, this marking, see what, see what everybody has. And they find this metal cage. And there's a lot of old metal things at this point in the archives, so it's not that unique. But what's really unique about this is a piece of paper that's stuck at the top of it. It doesn't say anything about where it's from, who it was, when it was made, all it says in it, on it, are the two words, from Quebec. Now what makes this story more interesting is that the Peabody Wessex Museum is located in Salem, Massachusetts. Site of the Salem Obviously, Witch Trials. Yeah. So if this woman was a witch, the story goes like, how did her cage end up in Salem? Yeah, of all places. Yeah. It couldn't have been coincidence. So they decided to do a massive, massive investigation to how this cage got there. Right. And this is where I go, go back to the museum where the story deviates. The story I've been told and that ha they have on findagrave.com and have it all over the place is that there was a fire and the cage went missing only to be discovered in Salem. So weird. Yeah. But the other story <laughs> is that this, the cage was sold and there was no fire or that the fire, there was a fire and the cage was stolen and then sold. Mm. And it made its rounds from Boston, New York. It was on different museums all around the, all around the United States ending up in Salem and that it was in Salem for over a hundred years and was only displayed once because no one really knew what this cage was. Can you see the cage? Uh, now? Yeah, you can look online. It's pictures of the cage. You can see like the, the bent metal in the shape, like in the shape of a person. Cool. Yeah, and there's lots of pictures too of like the scene where the man is walking past the cage and it attacks him. Right. And of course, lots of stories, right? So there's lots of questions like you know what was true about the story right and sure she was a woman she was obviously executed excuse me she was obviously executed there was there was a uh, a cage and there's some petitions now about having a statue made up for her as a symbol of women who are abused because she was a, a, a victim of domestic abuse <laughs> and also a murderer yes that's the other <laughs> side of it a du potentially double murderer right but or, cool yeah right. i see your bangle so there is, you know, the story, like, was she a witch? Was there any claims to that? Because it was, the Salem Witch Trials were 40 years prior to her conviction. So it was on people's minds. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like, it's not like uh, um, now where everyone's like, don't fucking get mad at someone because you think they're a witch. That's crazy. Yeah. It's like 40 years ago. It's like, well, remember... Could be a witch. Even like the Samuel Charles, then they still thought they were witches. Mm. Uh, you know, it was only later that people kind of came to terms that no, they weren't. You know, there's other things at play that made the people act that way. Right. So 40 years, that's like still being mad at 40 years ago. What happened in the 80s? Right. Yeah. Right. 
What what would happen in the eighties? Uh, um, the Berlin Wall came down. Um, war in Afghanistan. <laughs> um, Freddie Mercury doing a bunch of drugs. Yeah. Goddamn Freddie. Like forty years isn't that long to keep a stigma or something, right? right? So when you already have this fear of a witch from Salem, where they killed was it nineteen people, mm. to have an idea that there's another witch in Quebec City, not that far away from Salem. Sorry, do you know the time frame the nineteen people was roughly in Salem? Yeah, uh, like six months. Yeah, it was like through the like the one year I think they it's when they killed everybody, executed everybody. Wow. Okay. Fuck. That's just that's, that's just one guy. To, There's another one. There is another one, isn't there? Oh my yep. god. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. I'd like to go down there sometime. I just like going places and you can just feel the eerie vibe. Mm-hmm. I was at uh um it's not the it's not the Fort San Hospital, but it is a different hospital east of here that was creepy as fuck. And then they had a basement that was like they put the bodies in and shit like that and I just peeped my head down there and I was like this is not a place I want to be peeked by my head was it the Weber Mental Hospital? probably okay. I think so we played laser tag in there that sounds about right yeah, yeah. <laughs> I heard they did stuff in there after it was like shut down yeah yeah and they had like an art gallery in there once too and stuff oh really? I could see that I could see yeah, that it's cool that's actually I learned in the Weber Mental Hospital is where they uh, coined the term psych- psychedelic Oh, really? Because they were using LSD on patients. Lots of LSD. Yeah. Lots of... They said that they even um, cured alcoholism with LSD. Oh. At the mental hospital. Cool. But you would never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the mystery is, you know, how did the cage get down there? And what? who was this woman? So it's a different kind of mystery than we usually talk about. Usually there's like no answer to it. Mm-hmm. This one has an answer. So what do you think? Do you think that she was... There's multiple things though. Like yeah. there's... There's the guy who the hands were on his shoulder. Yeah. And how plausible is his recollection? Yeah. Right? Like, is he an alcoholic? He was intoxicated. So that wouldn't... Some of it. Yeah, definitely. But see, like, uh, and I hate that that almost just throws it out. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like, that just sucks because, like, I wish there was a little more meat there. Yeah. I know. Not just the word of a drunk man. Yeah. But still, like, did that man know about that place? Right. Did he? I don't know. It, like, it's a famous story, and it's a famous thing that happened there, so he might have known. Right. But, um, again, like, so let's say that isn't true. Then there's a whole story about the cage and the museum burning down. Right. But then that might not be true. Right. And it might also just be lady killed two people, died... Uh, birds ate uh, holes in her head, making making her a uh, human uh, whistle. Um, <laughs> guy was drunk and heard some shit. Wanted to be cool, and famous. Um, a cage was found with a leg. Cage was sold. Records weren't kept, kept track or something. Maybe someone like quit. Mm-hmm. who did the deal and then they didn't have any records of it and then the place burned down yeah you know yep. so much shit but like you said earlier there's no really big stories of Canadian witches like sure there's people who practice Wiccan who are right. Wiccans right and we know some I know some I think you don't the same people I know mm, okay. Yep. okay okay <laughs> so we know some Wiccans and I'll ask later who okay is, sure okay just to clarify, okay yeah. uh, so like Witches are a thing that, you know, it's possible that back then they wouldn't, have, they'd been more underground, right? Okay. Um, but you don't hear the same kind of things that we do with the Salem witch trials, right? Or what they did the witches like in, in Europe where they burned them at the stake or that kind of thing. Yeah. You don't hear yeah. about that in Canada. So like, it, you know, it's not impossible, but it's not, you know, doesn't, it, to have one instance of it isn't likely. But I like the idea of there being a witch. And yeah. the story has permeated and been around since, you know, the 1750s. And there's such a turbulent time in Canadian history with the switching from New France to England that it kind of like cemented into that time frame, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. Because there's always so many mixed emotions and so many changes that to have a woman in a trial and a cage and the story of a witch, it just kind of gets stuck into Canadian like lore. So I, I'm going to say, I want to say, yeah, she's a witch because there's nothing to say she isn't other than the fact that there weren't a, it's not a lot of witches. But murder itself isn't witchcraft. 
you know? Uh, but I'll say yes, just because I like the idea of there being a witch. Right. And because there's no reason to say she's not, because it's possible. I love the idea of there being a witch, and the witch is, like, bound to a metal case. Mm-hmm. And for hundreds of years, it gets revealed and moved around and ends up at one of the most uh, highest death toll of, of witches. Like, that's just a cool story. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't just revolve around one place because you probably list there's probably lots of legends that are only happen in that one town yes so that one town uses that legend yes. to raise their tourism right but yes. this isn't like that this is it was here it was here ended up here yeah kind of a cool circle and something that has a tangible thing to it because with the thing of with um granger taylor yeah there's nothing tangible besides the stuff he built right right with the things up north the 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 beheadings. Manhattan National Park, yeah. Those are, like, cases and obviously uh, people who've died, but there's nothing, like, physical. You can't go see it. Right. Even uh, what we talked about last week was the thing in Lake Ontario. It's a mystery. The ships are disappearing. Right. This, you can see the cage. It's mm. online. You I can. See. See. It was in the museum. Like, it, it was on display in Quebec City a couple years ago. So, like, it's something that actually is a physical, tangible thing that attaches to the story. I Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, because one... Yeah, one's a place, one's a physical phenomenon, and one is um, a bunch of people recalling Granger Taylor. So yeah, it's not yeah. like it's not really anything concrete like yeah. a steel, yeah, piece of history. That's crazy. Yeah, I thought you liked that story. I do actually like that story. I guess I'm just creating a movie in my head yeah. essentially, and yeah. I like that movie the best out of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite movie out of the four. Okay. That's fair. All right. All right. So I was going to tell you about um, uh, Quebec City and Levy and how Quebec City is kind of like the bigger brother. Mm. So this story, and actually it was, I think it's during the Cold War when, they, when this happened. So it's not like a creepy story, but it's just like a story that happened. They have all these cannons along the, sh- the Citadel in Quebec City. Like on the outside, like pointing outward? Yeah. Or, yeah. To defend the city from something that's think... not going to attack them anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they want to know if they still worked, right? Uh, so they decided to try it off in the winter, and the idea was to shoot a cannonball out of the cannon onto the river and have it just crush the ice and be done with it, right? So they shot it off across the river, and it flew, hit the ice, and then bounced across into Le Vie and smashed through a house. Oh, man. So it's just another way of Quebec City kind of picking on their younger brother. Oh, man. Could you, could you imagine the paperwork? <laughs> could you imagine a cannonball? Oh. Like... Oh, no, I could. What year is this? The one thing, yeah, the one thing coming in my house, I don't imagine it being a cannonball, no. <laughs> so did you want to tease about the next episode? Yes, I do. So we touched on um, British Columbia. Yep. Yukon. Uh, I guess Northwest. Yeah, it was Yukon. No, it was Northwest Territories. Yeah, yeah right. Sorry. Uh, Ontario, Lake Ontario, and Quebec. Okay. This next one, the first true crime episode, we're bringing it right back home to... Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan true crime. I'm a, okay, that's exciting. And we were alive during it. That'll be next episode That'll next, next episode. whenever we record again. So if you enjoyed this, you enjoyed uh, the past yeah. four. Oh, man. True crime next time here about it's in, it's in Saskatchewan. <laughs>